feel like a mask bandito today. I was sick earlier this week and went to the doctor and tested negative for flu and cold, so that made me feel somewhat better mentally. It made me feel better physically, but anyway, I'm glad to see the rain get rid of some of this pollen and allergies and all that stuff. So anyway, uh, hopefully we'll be able to, a voice will hold out today and uh, we'll get a blessing as we study God's word. <clears throat> our heads for just a moment. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you will uh, bless us as we study thy word today, and that you will guide and direct us and open our minds and our hearts to, to thy truth. We ask these things in the blessed name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. <clears throat> God's purpose in the great disappointment, 1844. You know, when we think of God's purposes, we typically do not think that bad things are, uh, you know, related to his purpose. We think of God as being good, and God is good. But sometimes we cannot see through uh, the portal, almost, you might want to say, because we, we're seeing something negative, and we're not really understanding what's on the other side. And so we're going to be looking at the great disappointment of 1844 and how that affected you and I. One of the most widely debated fundamental beliefs in the Adventist church has been what happened in and after 1844. Was anybody alive that? I don't think so. Not today. You'd, you'd be in the Guinness World uh, Book of Records if you, had, if you were. But the Seventh-day Adventist basic fundamental belief number 24 is titled Christ's Ministry in the Heavenly Sanctuary. And it describes the second and last phase of Christ's atoning ministry. And it also describes a work of investigative judgment that is part of the ultimate disposition of sin. Of all the Adventist fundamental beliefs, this has probably been one of the most debated subjects among theologians both within the church and outside the Adventist church. This subject could probably rank right up there with the great debates on circumcision back during the days of the disciples. But there's no question about the fact that Jesus is our high priest and he is ministering in the heavenly sanctuary on our behalf until probation closes and he returns to deliver his people. Some people believe that the sanctuary on earth was an exact replica of the one in heaven. However, it was just really a pattern that was, or plan or blueprint that God made for man. And there were actually four different sanctuaries on earth. They were somewhat different, but functionally they were the same. We had the Mosaic Temple or the Tabernacle. We had Solomon's Temple. We had Zerubbabel's Temple and Ezekiel's Temple. They were all different, but again, they had the same functions involved. Others believe that the sanctuary was to teach about the plan of salvation and Jesus in carrying out the duties of the high priest, but that there was not a literal building in heaven, for God does not live in a building that, that, that compares to what man builds and lives in. And then there's a third major belief that the work of the sanctuary involved what God does in our hearts. I personally believe maybe a combination of the second and third beliefs are on target. Jesus is ministering in our behalf in the heavenly sanctuary. And it's not a literal building. It's similar or that is similar to a man-made building that we would build. But even so, God was the architect of the earthly uh, sanctuaries that were built. He drew the plans, very explicit plans, for the building, and all the furniture components in it. But the Bible also te clearly teaches that Jesus himself is the temple. And he's the cornerstone of the temple. And that our hearts are part of that temple, wherein God dwells through the Holy Spirit. Our temple hearts have to be cleansed as well. You know, in, we've uh, 
I don't know how many weeks ago we talked about the soul cleansing and the, and the cleansing of the temple. Jesus cleansed a, a, the earthly temple at the beginning of his ministry. He had another cleansing of the temple at the end of his earthly ministry. But what those things represent are God cleansing our hearts as well. There's a lot of debate dealing with the sanctuary since the beginnings of the Adventist church. And they can be traced through the Millerite movement into the very segments after the Great Disappointment. That is, after the Great Disappointment, the Millerite movement sort of blew up. Some went that way, some went that way. They had different beliefs. And some just left completely. But before we go any further, I really do not believe that the 2300-day prophecy in Daniel will be an essay question at the gates of heaven. If so, the list of those with passing grades would likely not be too long. But it is an important and somewhat complicated prophecy, and some people leave this prophecy to the study of theologians. But as we look back on history, theologians have been known to be wrong. The largest Christian church in the world, with over a billion members, are proof of that. God chose seemingly uneducated disciples as well as somewhat uneducated prophets including Ellen White who would have fallen into that category. You see God just wants people with a teachable and willing heart. God wants all of us not just theologians to search the scriptures for truth and to fortify our minds with God's word through the blessing of the Holy Spirit which inspired the words to start with. Philippians 2.12 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I think we have that on the screen. Shot. We don't. Well, shame on me. <laughs> Great men of the Bible studied diligently. Even David, one of the smartest, most godly men mentioned in the Bible, did not immediately understand some of the prophecies of the Bible and hit the big picture. Or how about John the Revelator? It's clear that John wrote and saw what he had, saw in vision, but he had very limited understanding of the significance of what he was seeing at the time. Peter had a vision of unclean animals and was told to eat them. You remember that was offended him. But Peter initially understood this vision literally, but later he understood that the unclean animals were actually symbolic. And they were representing the unclean Gentiles and that the gospel message was to be preached to the Gentiles. And I'm thankful because we're here because of that. We're a part of those unclean animals that was in that, uh, in that vision. And so today, there's no question but Jesus, that Jesus is our high priest and that we will be judged before the second coming. If there was no judgment by God before he comes, Jesus could not bring his reward with him to the righteous dead and the righteous living. Jesus says in his last message in the book of Revelation, Revelation 22, it says, and behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. And so by clear logic, or at least my logic, there is a pre-advent judgment. And I will postulate even further that God knows at any moment in time whether we have a saving relationship with him. Just as God can hear a billion prayers at once, he knows each of us intimately by name. He does not need to line up billions of court cases at the courthouse and take the cases by one. How many of you have been to a courtroom before and had seen all the cases called? I know Dan Bowen has when he worked with probation and, and Rod and others. It's a slow process, isn't it? But listen to this. Just because sometimes when we think about court cases and, and, and judgment and all this stuff, we literally, because of our humanity, we think about you know, going to the courthouse and 
calling up one, you know, and that may last five minutes or it might last two or three hours or two or three months. And then you call another one. That does not work. You see, in 2023, it's estimated that 6,936 people died each hour somewhere around the world. And so if, if you apply that logic that you had to, this is just the current ones, not the past or anything. If you had to keep up with that, you'd, you'd have to process 6,936 cases every hour around the clock. A linear equation of court cases and judgment does not work when you consider the billions of people that have lived on this planet over the past 6,000 years. God is omniscient, and we do need to remember that man's limitations are not God's limitations. God knows our relationship with him at any moment in time, and whether we're in a saved relationship or a lost relationship. It's roughly estimated that, and roughly is a generous term, that 117 billion people have lived on earth so far. And that's over the, six, the last 6,000 years. But today's study of God's word is on a specific topic, the purpose of the great disappointment of 1844 and the cleansing of the sanctuary. And we're going to look at it from a slightly different perspective than we typically do. We're going to try to the best of our ability to look at the great disappointment of 1844 through God's eyes and perspective. That's a tall order. We're talking about humanity versus divinity's eyes. And we cannot see very far in the future. So we're going to look at, uh, again, at 1844 and try to understand what the Bible and history has to say about 1844. We're going to look at this event from the perspective of the overall plan of salvation. And while we typically, again, look at things from man's perspective, we're going to try, try to look at it from God's perspective. One Bible principle that we will be following in our study today is that the Word of God as a whole is a perfect chain, one portion linking into and explaining another. That comes from early writings, page 221. So to set up the premise of our study today, we need to study how God has acted in the past to give us an understanding of how he has acted in other situations and how he will act in the future as far as that goes. We're going to give you an example of that. You remember the story of Joseph, one of the best stories in the, in the Bible, in my opinion. I mean, some parts of it are not that good, but it had a good ending. And so let's take the story of Joseph. Joseph had some bad things happen to him. His brothers attempted to take his life only to later come back, get him out of the pit, and then sell him. That's what you call double, uh, in, what's the word, uh, rod double? Yeah. It, it was a, uh, a case where his brothers betrayed him twice. And so his brothers took him in and sold him as, uh, uh, to foreigners as a slave. Then Joseph was unjustly accused and thrown into prison, which we can imagine was an inhumane place to be. We see that Joseph's expectations of a favored life, a favored child, was turned upside down with all the unjust and terrible things that happened to him versus, and listen to this now, just think about this, versus the dreams that God had given him before all this happened. Can you imagine here having the dreams that, that uh, Joseph had and thinking the future was bright? All these good things, you know. And then to have your, to have your brothers basically Tried, almost attempted murder. It was a slow thing. They weren't going to kill him. They were just going to let the animals do that. And then sell him in slavery. And then for it to be falsely accused and be thrown into an Egyptian prison. But as we look back, God had a purpose. And he used the bad events in Joseph's life to become a blessing. Not to Joseph, or just to Joseph, but to the nation of Israel and the surrounding countries 
And Joseph recognized this purpose of God in hindsight. He couldn't see it to start with. And you and I couldn't see it. Let's read here in Genesis 50. We'll, we see a glimmer of this. As it says, and his brother, and that's Joseph's brethren, also went, and this is after the death of their father, went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And they were afraid that Joseph, now that the dad was dead, he was going to get even with them. But here, listen to what Joseph said. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am I in the place of God? Verse 20, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God, who, who now? God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye, I will nurse you and your little ones, and be comforted, or comfort them, and speak kindly unto them. That is, God had his finger on this all the time. And while we thought we were having uh, a certain uh, a bad event and all these things that were happening to Joseph, God was in control. God knew what was going on, and God had a plan. And we see it after it's unfolded. Joseph couldn't see it as he was going through it. And the times that we are going through experiences, we can't see the other side. But we need to know that God is in control, and he has a plan for us. Likewise, we could say that in the following, in allowing the terrible things Satan heaped upon Job, God had a purpose in allowing Satan to test Job and his faithfulness, a faithfulness that has been a standard for Christians through the ages. Yet Job didn't understand it as he was going through it. Similarly, we need to look for God's purpose in another great spiritual test today, the great disappointment of the Millerites in 1844. First, we have to briefly review some of the historical background leading up to 1844. On, on February 15, 1782, something happened. William Miller was born in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, 1782. In 1803, at the ripe age of 21, he married Lucy Smith and became a farmer. He later served in the Vermont militia, and he fought in the War of 1812. You remember reading about the War of 1812? William Miller fought in that war. Miller was originally a Baptist, but he became a deist. That's D-E-I-S-T. And then he tried to merge the two beliefs into one by studying the Bible. That was good of him. And since deism is not something we talk about uh, that much or come into contact with, we'll, we'll take a moment and look at the, uh, or try to understand a deist and a theist. And I think we have a slide there. You see, both theist and deist, they believe in God, the creator, but the theist, he's a little bit different, or she. The theist taught that God remained actively interested and operative in the world which he'd made. God was involved when his creation stayed involved. The deist, though, the deist maintained that God created the world and he created it as a self-sustaining self world and he's self-acting powers. And then he walked away. He says, walked away from it. And so William Miller is trying to get these two things where God's involved in the world, the, the theist position, and then he, this deist position that he had tinkered with, you know, was involved in, he was trying to figure out, well, did God just walk away from this world and uh, everything's going to play out and he'll come back one day and pick, see what, what happened over the last, you know, thousands of years. So, William Miller started studying. That's not a bad thing to do. He started studying the scriptures. He started at the book of Genesis and as he read through the Bible and studied, he became convinced of the uh, principle of interpretation for prophecies that a prophetic day equaled one year. Of course, he got that from Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4.6, 4, uh, which we use those same texts. And as Miller studied and researched prophecies 
further, he came to the prophecy in Daniel about the 2300-day prophecy. And he found that in the 2300-day prophecy, it started in 457 B.C., it would end in 1843. He came to this conclusion about in 1818 or 25 years before he calculated that the second coming of Jesus would occur. He studied for another four years and wrote a 20-point document stating that he believed that Jesus would come to cleanse the earthly sanctuary in 21 years, which would be the year 1843. Needless to say, this prediction and Miller's studies gained a lot of attention. And so I'm going to ask you a trivia question here. You know, just see if you're paying attention. What was the date that William Miller predicted Jesus would come? This may come to a surprise for some, but William Miller never predicted a specific date for the second coming. But he did believe that Jesus would come between March 21st, 1843, and March 21st, 1844. And Miller uh, published a synopsis of the teachings in a 64-page tract. Listen to the title of this tract. Only 64 pages in it. Here's the name of the tract. Evidence from Scripture and History of the Second Coming of Christ about the year 1844 exhibited in a course of lectures. Now, he was wordy when it came to a book title or a track title of 64 pages, wasn't it? Those dates, of course, passed, and Miller expressed his error, his disappointment. Yet he continued to believe in the imminent coming of the Lord up until his death on December 20th, 1849. However, and this gets back over to great disappointment. At an August 1844, August 1844 camp meeting in Exeter, New Hampshire, there was a Millerite preacher, one of the followers you know, of, of Miller. His name was Samuel Snow. And he presented at this camp meeting a midnight cry message that taught that Jesus would return on the 10th day of the 7th month of the present year of 1844 based on a karate Jewish calendar, which will be our calendar date of October 22nd, 1844. I told you the camp meeting was in August 1844. He was looking at Jesus coming back in October 22nd, 1844. The math on that, or the calendar computing, is that Jesus, when he was giving this message in camp meeting, he was teaching that Jesus was coming back in the next 60 days. That needs to sink in a little bit. What if you went to a camp meeting, listened to this guy, and he had all his facts and things laid out and dates and all this stuff and scriptures, and he was preaching convincingly because he studied it a lot, and many, many people were believing it. And the word was that Jesus was going to come back in 60 days. If that had been, been you, what would your reaction have been? You say, well, I've, I've got, let's see, I can do whatever I want to for the next six, seven weeks, and then I'll get ready to last week. I mean, you know, you can have all sorts of reactions. But the people took it seriously. For many, or the message, of course, spread like wildfire among the people. For many, it was a period of anticipation, great joy in repenting and concentrating on being ready for the second coming. For others, they just made fun of it, as the wicked did before the flood. But the second coming was not yet to be. The people apparently did not pay attention to the words of Jesus found in Mark 13.32. Mark 13.32 says, Jesus is saying these words, but of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. That is, Jesus is saying he didn't even know. The Father was the only one that knew. And so I don't know how they studied the Bible. They must have been just concentrating on Daniel, 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 or maybe Revelation. But they missed 
the book of Mark. We well know that October 22, 1844 passed without Jesus' second coming. And this date instead become, became known as the Millerites' great disappointment. One of those that were, was greatly disappointed that had been at the camp meeting was Hiram Edson. And listen to his, his look back. Hiram Edson wrote, Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted. And such a spirit of weeping came over us as I never experienced. Never experienced before. We wept and wept till the dawn. You see, like Jesus, parable of the sower and the seed found in Luke 8, many of the Millerites after this, they gave up. They said, I, I, I didn't really believe it to start with. I was just, I was just hedging my bets. But some people did not give up. You see, some, just like the seed, parable of the sower and seed, that seed, the word of God, had fallen on different hearts. Some hearts were, you know, very shallow. Some were deep soil, and they took root. Some believed that God's word did not fail, but that their understanding and their interpretation was incorrect. And their interpretation was incorrect. And we had these different groups. The largest of this uh, group started studying, and it became the Seventh Adventist Church, which now has 22 million members worldwide. One of the other groups that uh, I studied about was the Advent Christian Church. That was a, uh, came out of this splintering of the Millerites. And they are, they have a lot of beliefs just like us as far as a lot of different doctrinal beliefs, except for the Sabbath is one of the main things that they, and it, it, it's their, their statement, their church belief, number 10, we believe that the first day of the week is the day set apart by the early church in commemoration of Christ's resurrection should be observed as Christian Sabbath and used as a day of rest and religious worship. But in a lot of other cases, they are just like Adventists. And I hope that one day they will see the Sabbath truth and then accept it. But getting back to our main subject, the significance of 1844 and the Great Disappointment. Again, I think the words that we read a few minutes ago from Hiram Edson needs uh, repeating. They're both descriptive and important to note. Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted and such a spirit of weeping came over us as I've never experienced before. We wept and wept till the dawn. Can you put yourself in, in their situation there? You, can you feel the, just the heaviness and the pain of having expected Jesus to come for, for weeks and weeks and weeks? And that time came and he did they had gone through a time of intense and agonizing soul searching during the, the, those eight weeks. They had confessed wrongs to one another. Beyond all earthly matters, beyond all per personal earthly possessions, many had sold what they had to further the message that people could be saved. They believed in the second coming. Many farmers had not even bothered to gather at the crops that year. To these souls, the message of the impending second coming was so glorious and so wonderful just to think that Jesus was so near that the resurrection of the righteous, their mothers, their fathers, their brothers and sisters and their dear friends, their little children that had died and those that were living, Jesus was coming. The thoughts that the hardships of this world, the sickness, the death, and the disease, and the war, and hatred, and evil was about to be abolished. And in its place was heaven, heaven with God and the angels for eternity, filled with their entire beings with great joy that turned to great sadness and disappointment. Did God know that this was going to happen? Yeah. It, just as he knew about Joseph, he knew about Joseph's brothers, 
He knew everything. He knows into the future that we don't. Revelation 10 goes further on this. Let's look at this. Say, I believe Revelation 10 is a Bible prophecy that actually points to the great disappointment. Revelation 10, let's look. It says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth, and he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. You know, it's hard for us to comprehend th this here. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, that is, John says, I was about to write everything down, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up these things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Wow. And let's pause here. John the Revelator is about to write down the utterings of the seven thunders when a voice from heaven told him to seal up those things which he'd heard not to write them down. That was odd for God to reveal these things to John and tell him not to write them down. And what is very interesting is that something very similar happened and it's recorded in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel. Three times in the book of Daniel, 8.26, 12.4, and 12.9, God tells Daniel to seal the vision and the words. But this time, God specifies how long the vision was to be sealed until the end of time. God has a specific times in which he reveals his word. Man is prone to error when he tries to explain everything in the Bible. You see, you need to let God reveal it on his timetable. When we go, when man goes in and tries to go through every verse and say, this means this, this means this, this means this, you're on dangerous ground. Because God has his own timetable for giving understanding to the scriptures. We believe it is clear that the little book that was referenced in Revelation 10 was none other than the book of Daniel and the prophecies there. Let's look at Revelation 10, 7 here. It says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. That, that sounds like an end of time thing to me. As he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And listen to this here, verse 8. And the voice which I heard, that John heard from heaven, spake unto him again and said, Go and take the little book, which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon, upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and do what? Eat it up. Now, Rod, come over here and eat this uh, pamphlet for me. No, I'm just kidding you. <laughs> that, was, that would be a literal interpretation, wasn't it? But God says that we are to eat his words, and that means for us to consume those words. Give me the little book, he said unto me, take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And so this is describing the experience of the Millerites of looking at the, the second coming in 1844. It was sweet in their mouth, but it turned to bitterness when it got to their stomach just a little bit later, didn't it? Verse 10. John says, and I took the little book out of the angel's hand, I ate it up, and it was in my mouth, sweet as honey, and as soon as I'd eaten it, my belly was bitter. That tells me that God knew about the great disappointment. God knew God has a plan, and God has a purpose. And we're going to continue to understand that as we study and so we believe that there's no doubt that this prophecy in, in Revelation 10 applies to the great disappointment of 1844 where the sweet, joyful anticipation of the second coming was so overwhelming to the people, yet that sweet joy turned into the bitterness that we read about Hiram Edson, his, his words, a bitterness of disappointment. But the prophecy does not end at verse 10. Something good, something that God ordained came out of the great disappointment just as the story of Joseph, something came good out of his bitterness of being thrown in jail and sold and, and betrayed by his brothers. 
something good came. And where verse 11 tells us this, Revelation 10 and 11, or verse, uh, verse 11, it ends with a message. This is the last verse. It ends with a message that is important for you and me. And he, and he, the angel, said unto me, Thou must prophesy. And then he has an interesting word here. Again, before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Prophesy is not just prophesying, but it's also teaching. And so uh, we read in verse 11 that there remains a work to be done by the people of God in the closing days of this earth's history. The same spirit of soul searching and teaching others about God and the plan of salvation is to be carried through to the world till Jesus comes. That's our mission today. That's our mission for every Adventist, for every Christian that is following God until the second coming. Matthew 24 gives us that first commission. Jesus says, the gospel, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. You see, you see where we are? Since 1844, the great disappointment, the mission of the church has been to, it's again, it's a recommitment of, of sharing the gospel of Christ with the world. The one question that begs to be asked is, why was it necessary for God to have dedicated Christians go through the great disappointment? And then for God to reiterate the gospel commission to them to take the gospel to the world. After all, uh, over 1,800 years had passed between those two events. Jesus giving the great commission, and here in Revelation 11, the Great Commission again after the Great Disappointment. You see, God does everything for a purpose. We seldom understand that. We have to look between the lines. We have to look after the fact, and then sometimes we have difficulty seeing it. But I think there was a distinct purpose in the Great Disappointment of 1844, just as there was a purpose in Joseph's brother's Selling him into slavery, selling him, him being falsely accused and thrown into prison. It was through him, Joseph, that the world around him was saved. And it's through, and Joseph is a type of Christ, and so it's through Jesus that the world is saved as well. And so as we look back at the Millerites, we see a people that were eager beyond description who were anticipating the second coming. We see a people daily searching the scriptures. We see a people that were repenting. We see a forgiving people whose hearts were right with God and their fellow man. We see a people that regarded worldly riches as worthless. We see a people that wanted nothing separating them from God. Those adjectives should be describing you and I today. After the great disappointment, many were brokenhearted and quit believing the message. They, again, were like some of the different grounds that Jesus told about in the parable of the sower and the seed. They were, these were some, including William Miller, who still believed God's word but understood that there was a misinterpretation or miscalculation. But these people continued to study God's word. They hung on to God. They did not let go, even though they didn't understand what was happening to them, just like Job. He hung on to God, even though he did not understand all the troubles he was going through. They believed that God's word did not and cannot fail. The great disappointment was an event, a significant event occurring in the last days of this world's history that God had prophesied through John the Revelator, as we saw a while ago. God had a purpose. A huge, huge purpose for the people who went through the great disappointment and those that follow them. His people, a special people who hungered and thirsted after righteousness, who searched and inflicted their souls, who had repented, who did not call this world home but belonged to the second coming of Jesus. Those people were given the gospel commission again. 
They were to prophesy again. They were to preach the gospel and share it before all peoples, nations, and tongues, and kings. Now, there are some fallacies in all the churches, including the Southern Adventist Church. There are wheat and tares in the church. Some people that are, feel very complacent that believe that there's no new light or understanding to be found and that the pioneers of the church have actually figured out everything in the Bible so we don't have to do anything. Some people just like to buy a real easy book, reading book, read through an afternoon, check, check. Then there's the other stream, those that want to reinterpret the everlasting gospel to fit their lifestyle and rewrite the clear meaning of the Bible. We should run away from both of these extremes. But we do need to understand beyond the shadow of a doubt that God in his eternal wisdom wants his people to study the scriptures, all of us, for themselves, fervently and prayerfully. God wants a church that is pure, teaching the commandments of God and having the faith of Jesus. If the great disappointment had not occurred, would that have occurred? Would that have happened? You see, the proclamation of the three angels' message has a qualifier, an adjective before it. It's found only one place in the Bible. Revelation 14, 6 says something very special that some people do not pay much attention to. The gospel has an adjective in front of it. It's called, the adjective is called everlasting gospel. This is the only instance in the, uh, that this phrase is used in the entire Bible. You see, God knows the future and knew by the end of time many different gospels would be preached in the name of Christianity. Today, many of the Christian megachurches, thousands and thousands of members, are preaching a prosperity gospel. Others are preaching feel-good, self-worth, self-improvement gospel. Still others are more mere entertainment sites with professional musicians and cafes and social centers instead of worship of God's centers. I read about one church that even had a laundromat so you could do your laundry while you were in church. And then a few weeks ago I read about a church that was established by atheists to socialize in, but it's a church. There are Christian ministers who presume and preach that certain portions of the scriptures, are, that's not really true. Some portions of the scripture, they say, eh, it might be true. You know, they actually vote on what portions of the scripture are true, you know, different stories in the Bible. And there are still others that just say, it's not true, it's, it's a fairy tale. Still other preachers are lining their pockets, living in multi-million dollar homes, cruising around in the world in their private jets, and I know one preacher in Atlanta has his own Rolls Royce. You can find almost anything in the churches today that put a label on themselves as Christian, but they are not Christ-like. There's approximately 217 Christian denominations in just North America. And yes, there are many different gospels being preached today. There are false gospels being preached in millions and millions and millions are being led astray like sheep by these false shepherds. How could Matthew 24, 14 ever be fulfilled if the everlasting gospel was not being preached to the world? God has always wanted a special people, his ambassadors to the world, to share the gospel, not just any gospel, but the true everlasting gospel. The truth about God and the plan of salvation and the truth about sin, Satan's deceptions and lies are still doing horrific damage to the planet Earth, both within and without the church. These Bible truths were and are important in revealing to the world the true character of God. Just to give you an example, some theologians taught and many still teach that hell is an eternal burning inferno where the wicked will burn throughout eternity. What does that tell you about the character of God, if that was true? I, for one, abhor the thought that someone like Cain, that may or 
may not have ever accepted Jesus as a Savior, probably didn't, but has he been burning in hell for the last 6,000 years and being tormented and will continue to burn forever? God abhors that thought as well and grieves of their lost. Adventists and some other denominations believe in a literal hell wherein after judgment, they, the wicked will be consumed by fire. Some Christians believe that judgment is future. Why would a loving God burn people for thousands of years before judgment? Is God going to save to in the judgment for some? You know, I'm really sorry that you've been burning for several thousand years. You know, I have changed my mind based on new evidence that has come about. That happens in our society, doesn't it? As far as, you know, new evidence and, you know, you've been in, falsely in prison for, you know, 30, 40 years. The Bible teaches that the wicked will not be tortured through eternity, but they will be destroyed along with death and sin, and the Bible plainly teaches that. What would you th think of a father who took out cigarettes or matches or something just very small like that and burned a child over and over again for years? You see, that is the picture that some people, some preachers, paint of God as being a cruel, unmerciful God. But we serve a loving God. I'm here to tell you that God is a God of love and mercy, and his character is being maligned by thousands and thousands of false ministers because of misinterpretation of the scriptures. But God will destroy the wicked completely, even... The Bible says that it is a strange act, that it's a merciful act for God. Malachi 4.1 says, behold, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud and all that do wickedly shall be what? Stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. That's a mercy. You know, we have what we call mercy killings, uh, Go on in the world, you know, you know, people take lethal injections and things like that, or somebody is just in pain and sorrow, and they say, put me out of my misery type deal. God is a God of mercy and love, and instead of torturing people, the wicked, for millennia, for eternity, it is merciful to be put out of their misery. Without the great disappointment, I do not think that the everlasting gospel could be taught because of erroneous doctrines that crept into the church. The Sabbath truth would have been largely lost. The truth about creation that began being attacked by Darwin's theory of evolution in the 1830s, it would have, been, uh, would have taken over completely. Other false doctrines such as the secret rapture was also gaining acceptance. At the, near the time of the great disappointment. The immortality of the soul was being taught. If God had not raised up a Bible-believing remnant through the great disappointment, what type of church would he have at the second coming? Would he even find faith on earth? God does have a purpose. He had a purpose for the great disappointment. It was to raise up a church of believers that would follow the Bible truths, even if they were not popular. He wants a pure bride that has clothed herself with his robe of righteousness. He wants us to be consecrated Christians, serving him with all our heart, soul, and mind. And so let us not be complacent. Let us not be lazy and think that someone has figured out everything in the Bible and therefore we have nothing else to discover. One of my greatest feelings is when I understand something in a new light that I've never understood before as I studied the scriptures. But as I continued to study it, I find out I am not the first one to understand it. But it's still a joy to come to my own understanding of it independently. 2 Timothy 2.15. God tells us, it says, study. What's that word now? Study. study. Study and do your best to present yourself to God approved, a workman tested by trial who has no reason to be ashamed accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. 
We need to remember how God's led in the past. We need to study and be faithful workmen in handling and teaching the word of truth. Let's, I'd like to share with you a, a quote from gospel workers here. It's uh, very meaningful. In 1844, when anything came to our attention that we did not understand, here's what the people did. We kneeled down and asked God to help us to take the right position. And then we were able to come to a right understanding and see eye to eye. There was no dissension, no enmity, no evil surmising, no misjudging of our brethren. If we but knew the evil of the spirit of intolerance, how carefully we would shun it. At that time, one error after another pressed in upon us. Ministers and doctors brought in new doctrines. We would search the scriptures with much prayer. And the Holy Spirit would bring the truth to our minds. Sometimes whole nights would be devoted to searching the scriptures and earnestly asking God for guidance. Another uh, quote here. We must learn. Who's, what, what's the pronoun here? We. That's me and you. We must learn that others have rights as well as ourselves. When a brother receives new light upon the scriptures, he should frankly explain his position. And then, that is not enough. And every minister should search the scriptures with spirit of candor to see if the points presented can be substantiated by the inspired word. 2 Timothy 2.24. It says, The servant of the Lord, that's us, must not participate in quarrels, but must be kind to everyone, even tempered, preserving peace, and must be skilled in teaching and patient and tolerant when wronged. He must correct those in, who are in opposition with courtesy and gentleness in the hope that God may grant that they will repent and be led to the knowledge of truth. Uh, accurately understanding and welcoming. That's the amp Amplified Bible. That is, we aren't to get out there and slap each other and say, you know, you're wrong, slap them again, you, you, you believe it. We are to have a spirit of gentleness and kindness as we study the words with someone that may not even come close to believing the same as we do. So some lessons there. In conclusion, just as Jesus came to reveal the Father and the character of God, God wants his people, us, to be people of the word, witnesses down to the end of time, and spread the everlasting and true gospel message. That would not have happened if not for the great disappointment of 1844. God had a purpose in the great disappointment of 1844. He wanted the people to learn the truth from his word and reveal the truth, the everlasting gospel to a dying world. The Advent movement and the Adventist church has, given a mission, has been given a mission by God of sharing that truth. And Satan has done and will continue to do everything within his power to defeat God's plan. But God's in control, and we know that he's already sealed the victory for all who believe and trust in him and trust with him all their heart, soul, and mind. That's us. God wants the same spirit that the Advent pioneers had to go into all the world so that a great multitude of people of all nations and tribes and tongues might hear God's word, the everlasting gospel, and be saved. And so it's my prayer today that we will do God's will in this great work that he shared with us. The great disappointment led to a restoration of truth, a restoration of the everlasting gospel that is, again, to be preached to all the world before the second coming. The great disappointment led to a cleansing of the sanctuary, God's church, our hearts, God's people as they cast off false teachings and beliefs and search for the truth. The mindset, the purity of thought, the humbleness, the searching for truth that had been cast to the ground led to the restoration of truth and the foundation of the Adventist church. We need to continue that tradition of being faithful to God's word and truth. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the scriptures, the Bible, so that we can have an understanding of the plan of salvation, of sin in this world, of death, 
and all the conflicts that are going on between wicked and good people. That started in heaven, and that's something we cannot even imagine. War in heaven. That's war on this earth against principalities that we cannot even imagine. But dear Lord, we pray that you'll give us understanding, help us to be strong, help us not be distracted by all the things that are going on in this world. Help us not be distracted or discouraged by the bad things that happen in our life. Because we know that over and over and over again, that you are in control and that you bless even through the bad things. You have a plan. And the only thing that we have to do is submit ourselves to your will and everything will be all right. Again, we pray that you will bless us. Help us to be faithful witnesses to all the world, to everyone we come into contact with, whether we even know their name or not. We pray that you will uh, give us the right words to speak. Maybe it's just a smile that we give someone that's discouraged. Pray that you'll bless us as we study thy word and that you'll give us clear understanding of whatever we need to know and that we'll be, be able to, to share that with others because that's your will to, for us to be witnesses of the everlasting gospel to every nation, tribe, and people in this world, that many, many, many people will be saved to the kingdom through that effort. We ask these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior and our Deliverer, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen.